because you have uh, introduced this title in the book of the uses of disorder. So can you say something about the disorder concept from the angle of order? So the opposite, what is the order if there is disorder? Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting uh, both of us uh, to join you in your inaugural uh, session. And I hope you can find the book and read it uh, uh, somehow. Uh, I would say about what the title means has a little backstory to it, which is that in my view as an urbanist, the problems that we face in the city are problems of rigidification and fear of informal uh, uh, relations between people, which are not controlled planned. Uh, and what, when I originally wrote Uses of Disorder, it was the notion that uh, people develop uh, socially and even psychologically by learning how to deal with things that are beyond their power to regulate and control. And um, disorder is not anarchy, it's the experience of uh, being faced with complexity, complexity which can't be managed in a simple way. Uh, so the word disorder is, a, it maybe a better word would be disordering uh, for what I looked at in the beginning of, when I wrote this book a very long time ago. Uh, when Pablo and I began working together, it became clear to me that he was thinking about ways that this is not merely a social process, but is also a literally a design process of creating infrastructure, which is complex, of creating housing, schools, public spaces, um, which are not uh, controlled in that kind of top down manner. And so this book came out of our collaboration to look at uh, what would be the architectural and indeed engineering uh, reflection of an open city. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you want to say something about I would love to hear, Pablo, your, your insight, because this was also something that very easily people can say that, well, it's an oxymoron because designing is a certain way of creating order always. And you are writing there quite deliberately that there is, there is an, a, it is possible actually to really design so-called for this order for, or for complexity. No, definitely. And, and I think that in part, the title is also a provocation and a provocation to, to think. So I think that, as Richard was saying, this comes from, I mean, I, w when I read the uses of disorder, I started to have curiosity on how the things that Richard had written about uh, 50 years ago could be taken into, into architecture and urban design, particularly as an architect, we always have kind of like the, I don't know, the envision of, I mean, when we read books uh, that are more in the field of urban sociology to think about how to transform this into, into urban design ideas. But then you reach that kind of like contradiction. Okay, how can we actually design disorder when designing itself is kind of like a, an exercise of putting things in order. And I think that the, the way to address this question was through, through the infrastructure, so thinking uh, in the infrastructure, uh, think about infrastructure as, uh, as something that create conditions. So, uh, and thinking about the role of, of urban designers at setting up certain conditions for this disorder that Richard uh, talks about, uh, this, this complexity and this experience of people facing complexity in cities, yeah. how to create public spaces um, uh, that, that enable that. So I think that it came from, from that kind of curiosity. And I think that also is what, what creates kind of like the structure of the book from going to the infrastructure uh, to, to kind of like seeing how things are built in the surface and in the section and then come back and, and reviewing what is the process for putting all together.
I think this is very interesting, this indeed, this infrastructure also, because it is actually something that in a certain way, what sometimes confuses these discussions, because you are also actually addressing the question of participation and, and, and these more co-creative processes and certain problematics. Uh, I don't know your experience, but my experience is partly that people are often, when you are asking something from them, they are thinking about the outcome, but actually infrastructure as an idea is of course, creating basically the conditions more than the outcome. So perhaps it is something that you need to be a designer for even. Well, you know, the, the thing uh, that is really um, a difficulty for us in uh, design work now is that we don't take seriously the notion of co-production mm -hmm. space. Um, the social inequalities, uh, often get in the way. So that co-production really means a kind of, um, uh, a kind of uh, not shaming exercise, but something in which the people who are going to be inhabitants of the space feel less legitimate to actually design than um, the people who have designed skills. And to me, it's a great challenge to think about how to enable people who don't have those design skills um, to actually participate and have uh, a voice. Mm -hmm. And in my own planning work, uh, that's why I've, uh, at the UN, that's why I've, I've tried to create innovations that allow people to visualize either on computer or using styrofoam blocks or something like that, simple like that, to envision design alternatives and then discuss them. There, I mean, this is a real problem of expertise. How yeah. do we reconcile expertise with democracy? And um, our book is in one way trying to deal with that by saying that the infrastructure is something that an expert of public can provide. But the uses of those infrastructure possibilities are things that can be constructed literally by people who uh, are, are going to live those designs. Um, but it's a, it's a very gray area and uh, it's, um, what I find, as I say, so frustrating about this is that there's a lot of rhetoric around this, but not much actual uh, uh, exploration of ways to reconcile uh, this relationship between knowledge and, and, and democracy. Yeah. Pablo, you are working with education, of course. So. Uh... Is this something that uh, you can address in the in the context of educate, educating architects or urban planners? Yeah, definitely. Um, so just just to follow, uh, I'll, I'll reply on the education yeah. planners just in a second. But just just to follow on Richard was saying, I think it's important to understand that there are that co-production has. I mean, it has many parts, but but we can identify clearly two parts. The co-production is in the process of I don't know. Uh, of, of, on our regeneration process, which was which uh, it, I, I've worked and, and Richard as well in in different processes where you work with different communities to to put together proposals and, and agree on proposals, but also there's a part on co-production which we insist a lot in the book, which is on how to build a public space that once built people can still participate on on transforming yeah. it uh, continuously. So I think that's another very important part of co-production that sometimes is. Is forgotten because if you do kind of like a very meaningful co-production process but you then do like a very closed public space that does not have the capacity to evolve then at the end it becomes kind of like a rigid space that becomes obsolete very very quickly so i think that that that's also quite quite important and linked to your question around education is that what i've done to solve this issue of kind of like this dichotomy between the expertise of the urban planner and the local experts of the people that live there and know the area is to work in partnerships. 
And I've done that by partnering, for example, with different campaigns that are resisting the demolition of their of their housing estate. And they, they I mean, they're not architects, so they don't have the yeah. tools to develop architectural proposals as an alternative. But by partner up with uh, with them, like people that, that know how to do it and people that have the local knowledge, that's something that 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 I found very productive. It has many challenges. I'm I'm, I'm now in in a project also uh, here in London where I've partnered with with kind of like four local people to to deliver the project, and that also kind of like it, it has a lot of complexities. About the end, you kind of like have this kind of like good mixture of local knowledge and uh, urban planning uh, skills. Mm -hmm. uh, then the uh about about education so what what i did when i uh, so i joined ucl seven years ago and what i started putting together since i joined and i've been running it for four years now is a course it's called it's called civic design and uh, what we do is that every year i partner up with a different community organization uh, based in london and the students uh, do work in partnership with that community organization, which is sometimes it's a local campaign, sometimes it's a group of residents. They have different, different, let's say, size and scopes, uh, but uh, students are directly exposed uh, to these uh, experience on, on co-production and, and co-design. So that, that, so I put kind of like a lot of emphasis on the curriculum in, in that because there was not, not such things in the schools. There was in planning school, I mean, there was kind of like a lot of theory on that, but I think it's important that they experience the, the practice as well and the challenges that it has uh, running these kind of like these processes. Exactly. Uh, the one thing I'd add to this is that I think in terms of uh, designs themselves, actual, uh, the actual objects that we're designing, the, the challenge here is to look at ways of creating incomplete form uh, as designers so that there's a possibility of, of change and, and, and evolution and that the completion is something that successive generations can, can deal with. How to give the bones, but not the whole thing. That runs against capitalist ideas about a product. Mm -hmm. A product is not a process. Yeah. It's a thing that's finished, it can be sold, and it's a commodity, and so on. Exactly. So that I think dealing with incomplete form is necessarily taking a kind of pushback against capitalist ideas of, of uh, production. Mm -hmm. And that makes it even more complicated. Um, very difficult to tell a city council saying, How much will this cost? You say, Well, it's in process. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> you know, they're not very happy about, about this. Well. This question of process is, I think, extremely interesting. I had the pleasure of actually listening to one of your talks uh, earlier and, and uh, uh, one thing that I, I made many notes, but one thing that I was thinking was so very interesting, I would like to continue with, with you, Richard, on this, this idea, because you pointed out in a certain way, because there came a discussion about, so what is the role of city planning in a certain way, a very, you know, uh, an idea of that this is, the, that's, that's the ultimate order creation. And you said something about this role of city planning that can be actually to defend basically the more organic, the more disorderly city against this commodification. Can you a little bit uh, elaborate on that? That how do you see that the, actually the role of the so-called top-down uh, public institutions creating a, an idea of the city could be more? Well, I don't. Um, that's a really complicated question. <clears throat> I, and I don't think there's one, um, there's one response to it. I, um, in the, the work I do at the United Nations, we are constantly fighting uh, a struggle to protect what are seen as dysfunctional communities, which are informal, small scale, 
largely poor communities from development. And what development tends to mean is something that improves in some ways material conditions like quality of water or continuity of electricity, but at the expense of creating an environment which is no longer controlled by the people who live there. And so you can easily slide into a kind of romanticism about a kind of anti-development, you know, stopping any kind of growth in the name of preserving community. And one of the uh, really in, uh, uh, in involving things for me about this book and about working with Pablo is to rather than put this as a, a negative development to see alternative ways of, of development and particularly of investment, which still uh, let it possible, make it possible for people to co-produce. And it's, um, I, I'm sure Finland is much more enlightened than uh, the Anglo-Saxon world, but in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, it's a struggle uh, because uh, uh, develop, it's still tinged with that old uh, notion that you know material fixity and material stability is a foundation for growth, and that's not true. Certainly not going to be true in the age of climate change. But you get a, it's a kind of almost hemostatic notion of the city as a system that's envisioned as growth. And from that notion of the city that's, you know, uh, where form and functions fit very closely together, comes a whole notion of imposing order top down. Yes. So that's what we're, we're trying to, rather than be romantics about this and say we don't want any growth. We're trying to look at ways, alternative ways of development, which don't suppose that kind of hemostatic, equilibrated, imbalanced city. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry, we've talked enough. Ask no, us. absolutely. But we, we, I would take one more thing because you said about Finland, so we have to take this one, and then I will let the stage to roam for free because we talked about Pablo something that I would like really to actually to point out you talk also you have a, in the conversation a bit about different layers of welfare and I think this is something because we have a very specific idea about uh, welfare maybe as a, as a Nordic state but in a certain way I would like to hear your thoughts about it maybe I give this to Pablo because we had a talk about it so if you can a little bit elaborate on that that uh, idea yeah so in, in the book and this is this, this is something that comes from conversations that that richard and i have had uh, while writing the book we uh we talk about how uh kind of like a, let's say a, a two two parallel strategies that are interconnected between each other mm -hmm. which are um municipalism and networks and these are two strategies on how to implement or let's say or infrastructures for this order that um and the so it has two layers that are interconnected uh when we talk about municipalism um we talk about the need of having kind of like open institutions that provide basic services such as housing education Good public spaces, uh, health services, and so on to uh, to people, and that ensure that also that no one's left behind. So ensure that particularly those communities more at risk uh, are are put kind of like extra resources in, in, in to, into them, and that and that yeah that they are not left behind. So I think, and then the, this municipalist initiative, they also have the role of understanding understanding learning and supporting things that happen from the grassroots and i think that's what many institutions fail uh, to do that they uh that how they in their interaction with the with the grassroots organization and how close institutions and bureaucratic institutions kind of like 
do not have the capacity to let's say to to have these interactions and because when we talk about networks we talk about how and this is inspired in kind of like in anarchist and cooperative movements how there could be different grassroots initiatives that happen from the bottom up in the city uh, that are independent from each other but they can kind of like be interconnected as a network they can learn from each other and 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 also, I mean, they, I mean, since they are kind of like from the, they happen from the grassroots, they have kind of like a lot of capa capacity for kind of like innovation. And, and in many cases, what happens is that there's kind of like the dialogue that happens between institutions and this grassroots institution is kind of like an oppositional one, where if there's a supporting one, uh, the, relation can, the, the relationship can be much more productive for, for both. Uh, and what we talk about in the book is how this let's say more community-based organizations can provide other level of, of um, welfare uh, that ensures that people have kind of like social relationships, they have certain care support, uh, that is more like a mutual yep. uh, relationship of, of caring about each other and, and also exchanging different resources. That, that does not substitute, and that's important to say, does not substitute the, let's say, the, the, the main uh, uh, state-led welfare state, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, comes as another layer that complements it and supports it. Um, and that is important to, to support economically and with resources and enabling it uh, in order to have kind of like, yeah, these different layers of, of welfare that makes cities more resilient. And in case the the estate fails for certain reasons, there's also like another safety net. Exactly. And this is very interesting also because it has to do partly with the narratives that we also create very much like of, of, of how, we, how we address certain structures and functions. I would like to uh, now open a bit the floor because we now talked about also the municipal angle. So if, if uh, the design director of the city of Helsinki, Hannah Harris is there, so can I entice you to pose the question? Thank you, Katya, for the introduction and, and really great to be with you here today. Um, ma many, many things I'm scribbling down, loads of notes here. So I'm currently, as of uh, the past year, been working as chief design officer at the city of Helsinki. So very much working in a municipal setting um, on those intersections, perhaps of, of expertise and democracy, which was brought up here. And, and how we um, how how do we use design? How do we work with architecture? But uh, for the note here, I also come from a background of urban studies, and that kind of uh, what what cities are and where they're going is uh, very much dear dear to me. At the same time, and I'm thinking one one sort of I perhaps wanted to start with something um, a broader spectrum that uh, which is the notion of time. And you mentioned here, of course, about the importance within a um, like Pablo has explored uh, specific design tasks or examples as well in the book, uh, book, but um, the kind of what capacity we can build to keep those places transforming or evolving over time. How uh, how does that process not stop? But but something perhaps broaden it out a little bit from that because of course as cities we struggle with those notions of time and especially to do with participation. So. Let's take any given um, plan people are, we have very good sort of legal frameworks in the Nordics, of course, of how, how people are involved in different planning processes and so forth. But one challenge in there is, of course, that, that sort of blurring of time. You are part of a given process and, and in a way the fruit or the different dialogue, the different elements that go into that process might become um, they might be materialized or become visible or, or somehow take form somewhere much later down the line. You'll have some larger, um, uh, let's say, neighborhood development project or, or different trans transport project or, or what be it. So that kind of idea of where, what was I part of happens somewhere down the line. Yeah. And, and of course we have those and any city will have those things that um, are slow. These are slow processes, but how do we better um, in a way couple those slower processes with something that is more of, of experimentative nature, something that um, 
happens in different stages and how those stages then feed into each other. There was a notion in the introduction already of the book about indeed focusing on different stages of any given uh, development of any given place and particularly on uh, something that you coined the initial move that we should focus on what is the initial move and what that what does that do so i'm i'm asking you that what should those initial moves be um i'm not sure i can give you a generic answer to that uh uh and i also want to respond to something uh that very provocative which you had said before which is who belongs to this process and how do you do that and may i respond to that first and maybe since i don't know the answer to the second <laughs> as clearly uh leave that to Pablo. um one thing that has been very striking to me in a very particular way is how uh, Central Park, which is New York's great, you know, lung in the center of the city, uh, was revived after a period in which it became uh, drug infested, uh, it had physically decayed, uh, and so on. Uh, there was, when I was in the Planning Commission, there was an attempt to police it entirely to make it a space which was uh, in which nothing could go wrong. And that did very little to solve the problem of how could people use this wonderful lung. It was then turned over to an NGO, a non-governmental agency, whose members uh, actually pay something to belong to what's called the Central Park Conservancy. And the membership is constantly changing. So the body that's now looking after Central Park is non-governmental. It's, um, uh, and it's one with a shifting cast of characters uh, and in which people actually pay to belong to this organization. And it takes care of everything in Central Park from planting trees to police to all of that. It is the most successful planning effort in the last 30 years, years of New York City planning history. And the reason for that was not merely that it invites participation, but it invites people to, um, to make a donation. I mean, you can belong to the Conservancy if you don't donate. Uh, but um, the idea about that was that the body which is planning is Saskia, when, uh, sorry, <laughs> we're at my home, so you know how that is. Um, the idea about that is that it's a corporate body which has responsibility for this, and it's a lot of replanning that needs to be done. Um, so I try to use that in a model, as a model in working, for instance, in Dharavi in uh, Mumbai, uh, which is a very poor part of Delhi, that people join civic associations and that the association has a responsibility, it takes it out of the political realm. And it's amazing that even in Dharavi, people will pay small, very small amounts of money to say, I belong to this association. So I'm, I'm quite interested in that. I'm, quite interested in the NGO as a replacement for government, uh, just because it's a kind of participation which is collective and, and uh, uh, it's, it's got a whole different configuration. About the question of, of what is the first move, can I kick this over to you, Pablo? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there's, there's kind of like very many different levels in that question I, and it kind of like resonates to some of the discussion in the book and even also to some of the experience that I'm having even after after the book because one of the you, you were mentioning time I think time is quite a key yeah, a, a very important thing in particularly in co-production and co-design processes having sufficient times to to do it properly I think that's something that I've 
I've experienced and sometimes working with with let's say with institutions sometimes you feel the pressure of having to deliver like core design process sometimes too quickly uh, and having kind of like that pressure kind of like year budgets and things like that that sometimes do not go in accordance to how things should I mean the pace of certain things but then of course uh, the second part of the question of, of what could be done first uh, I think well I think that links to what we were just discussing before about how we're talking about a process and not a product and and for example when running kind of like a co-design process one needs to be very clear on what is it kind of like what is the scope of the project what is going to be delivered and in which time frame or what is I mean no what is going to be delivered because there's uncertainty on that but having kind of like at least the scope and the time frame of the project but also be very clear how it, each project is kind of like the beginning of, of a process in the book we what we discuss is that the first initial moves should be something that i mean a, a piece of infrastructure that create this initial negotiations and when we talk about negotiations we talk about okay what are these piece pieces of infrastructure in the city it could be i don't know it could be a public space it could be an access to energy it could be a shared solar energy panels it could be many things what are these things that are going to enable an engagement with this space, um, particularly when you're working with spaces that might not have kind of like a lot of people going around or a strong engagement. What are these initial interventions that 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 will create that? And, th and they're very context specific, so um, and they need to be done relatively soon. Uh, for example, in a project that I'm involved now, part of the process is thinking which are the priorities that should deliver first in order to trigger this kind of things and i think that's something quite important to have it present also in these processes that they there is kind of like a clear or there, there's some kind of output that people can engage with uh at the beginning and that people understand that this is kind of like the beginning of a process so there's a matter there's a clear thing on in, in this process of co-design and engagement there's an important part which is about the communication how things are communicated how things are transparent uh and then on acknowledging that we're working on a process and and thinking together with people which are the key things that that could trigger um uh certain interactions that they can lead to further interventions in the process um also for example in the project that we're working now we have budget for a certain amount of things uh so we acknowledge that this is i mean we're doing this for the next two years but then this is this needs whatever we deliver needs to be the beginning of farther things so it's not kind of like a finished product but it's kind of like farther things that would be useful for continue for a continuous process fantastic thank you hannah and uh if you indeed have questions then please make this little raised hand and i will i will address i saw one hand but it was already taken down yes now here here she is so tatiana bernard please feel free to ask your question yeah i wanted to first ask like how do you see like this relationship between scale co-design and like tangibility because that's one thing I did a few interviews to a lot of people that work in co-design talked a lot about this tangible aspect of it. And I think Hannah, she also described that too, because these processes for urban processes can be 10, 20 years, you know, and you'll never, it's very hard to see where your red thread of participation, where it ends up kind of. So yeah, I was wondering, um, yeah, between these three scale, co-design and tangibility, and maybe even sometimes trust as well. Um, which is something that I am quite interested in, but I don't know if that um, is a, yeah, but there's just this maybe triangular relationship, if you have any thoughts. Well, just uh, these very interesting observations, just working back on it. Uh, I think the issue of trust is uh, oversold, uh, particularly in complex communities kind of communities we deal with in, in New York uh, or, or in London for that matter, 
where you have mixtures of uh, people of different religions and certainly of different races. The notion that trust is a kind of foundation of communication very, very dubious. You know, there are good reasons why people don't distrust each other as actors. What you want to do, in my experience, is build a set of cooperative processes that uh, don't depend on, on uh, aren't so personalized and so psychological. That is, um, you need to uh, get the garbage out of Central Park, uh, uh, or you need to clean up a public playground. And uh, cities are in personal spaces anyhow. Uh, and somehow, I don't think that's a condition to be overcome, particularly when you have aversive groups dealing with each other. So I, I, in my own planning work, I've always tried to focus people on the task at hand rather than on developing community. That's, that's always been my aim in this, not to create solidarity, uh, but to create uh, cooperation. A big, big difference. Uh, and um, it's, it's a, at the urban scale, a little like the difference between uh, nation building and solving a problem uh, in Afghanistan of you know, a particular group uh, that is threatening uh, the rest of the world. I mean, we make a terrible error when we think that the end of city planning is community. I just don't believe it. It's practical. Um, so, I, I, and I think it's, you know, it's theoretically as well as, uh, as uh, practically the important thing that our aim is, is task-based uh, rather than communal. communal. Based. It's about cooperation rather than solidarity. Um, this question of scale is a real, it's a wonderful question about this. We sort of sometimes think that the more local the scale, the more easier it is for people to cooperate. And things like, uh, like uh, collaborative budgeting, which is done in Brazil through uh, cities from all over Brazil now, shows that can, you can have at a fairly large scale cooperative interactions by using the net as we're doing <laughs> today. But it has a, another dimension as well, which is that for certain kinds of problems, when you the aim is to get a, as personal as possible. The problem itself can't be addressed. This is a big issue for us now in the UN in terms of, of, of climate change and uh, uh, energy resources. The old sort of, and I would think very romantic thinking about this of the generation before mine in the UN was, you know, solar panels on every roof, you know, every local community producing its own energy and so on. This turns out to be a fantasy. And it means that people just don't have enough energy. They need a grid. And that means that in poor places that they're going to have illegal access to that grid. Oh, the nature of how that works. Uh, same thing with water. You can't produce locally the water that people need locally. So I think the trick is how to scale up to the level of the problem you're dealing with and still have inputs from the, from the users. And we know how to do that in community budgeting. We don't know very well how to do that with climate change. There's a whole model for uh, personal involvement in climate change is that it's local. It's your, your grid. So I think it takes a kind of, it, 
we should we should take this um, resilient case as a kind of best practice for more uh, for more uh, for richer societies like that. Where, you know, I mean, I'm sorry to give you such a long response to this, but this it's a very it's a really big question for us, which is kind of breaking the romance of the locals. And uh, we, it's a big question for us in dealing with, um, with climate change, but I, I think it's, it's true, true more generally. Thank you so much for the, for the answer and also to the question. I would now uh, address the next ones who can prepare their questions. So, uh, Mr. Nitin Sodi from Aalto University, then Elina Kiiski-Kataja, who is researching in democracy, and then I would ask Mari Vatovara, who is the professor in Urban Academy, to prepare their questions. Sorry, Pablo, to get in the middle, but, but you can address also some thoughts that <laughs> came out. So, uh, sorry, I'm sorry to give you such a long answer. No, 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 it's, these, are, these are all uh, intricate uh, topics, so I think everybody gets very much out of it. So Nitin, please... Uh, Feel free to ask a question. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me for this. I really enjoyed uh, the discussion so far. Uh, what I wanted to bring up more was around the notion of how disorder has to do with vibrance in a city politically. Uh, because uh, having moved here into Helsinki from New York for, for, for many years, I noticed the difference in the organic vibrance of a particular city, uh, how certain kinds of spaces create a self organized capacity for agonism. So in New York, I was involved in many different movements around community gardens, around Occupy, around um, many political actions that were happening organically around the city quite often. Uh, and that is something that perhaps in the Nordic context tends to be slightly more carefully orchestrated uh, with pr proper permissions, with proper planning and thought given into it, which I also find uh, utopian and certainly uh, comfort comforting, but that's the discomfort of what happens in a city where you have to confront these agonistic perspectives uh, creates a certain kind of vibrance. Um, and I think the notion of disorder isn't simply about the architecture of a city, it's also about the social structures a city permits through that architecture. So I, I do like the framing you bring, uh, the issue of uh, how places like Bharavi and Mumbai and others are so vibrant are precisely because they permit a certain kind of uh, uh, social capacity for, for, for de democratic exchange. So I wanted to sort of bring that up because you have a chapter in your book around the politics of the hidden city. And I wonder if that's what you're trying to address in part uh, uh, in your work. Uh, Bob, uh, so, so I think, but maybe Richard can complete the, uh, the answer because the, that, that chapter is, is he, he's part of the book. But what I would say is that what I, some of the things that I've seen in the book is that a lot of the places that we really value today in cities, they've come from different social struggles and, and, and contestation and their product of that contestation. Um, I don't know if we th think about spaces in London like uh, like Portobello Market or the Notting Hill Carnival, they've come from struggles from the, mainly from the Caribbean community. Uh, and these are places that are internationally uh, recognized today and they're part of why London is a, is a, is a city that, that is well known internationally. So I think that's something, that's something important to have in mind in the sense of facilitating these processes uh, can make cities much richer in the sense of having like like good uh, social good social value. I think that, that that would be my main point. But maybe I'll let Richard to complete the the answer. Well, I just to say I I, I think what you say is is, is absolutely spot on. Is that um, it's very difficult to have a vibrant culture in which you're uh, told how to vibrate, <laughs> and so uh, uh, that's true in politics as, as much as it's true in uh, intimate life. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the downside of that 
is that those vibrant cultures tend to be impoverished. Uh, I think it's harder for bourgeois or for comfortable, and I imagine Helsinki is a relatively comfortable city material. They have the same kind of energy of feeling you've got to get involved, otherwise things are gonna collapse. But people have that in, um, in more tense, in, in more impoverished situation. But I think that's uh, spot on. Can you tell the very me, I, do I know you as, you were involved in a lot of New York City uh, uh, local initiatives. A couple of them are occupied, especially. Yeah. yeah. But what I was going to say is, is exactly in those moments of collapse and crisis that those structures actually start to show a different face. So when Hurricane Sandy happened in New York, as you remember, it was a local organizing that helped. And, and all of these moments perhaps show the capacity of the city to do something. The disorder right. is necessary to allow the capacity to thrive. Right. Um, well, uh, uh, may I ask you a question? I mean, one thing that has uh, rather perplexed me in New York is how these movements of the sort that you were involved in leave a trace. And I guess it goes back to the very first question that uh, or discussion we were having. Do you feel that, that the kind of organizing you were doing was such that that uh, had a kind of sustainable life in it that could leave a trace, or is it something that's very focused on a specific problem at an immediate moment and you know disappears? Yeah, I think we can look at it historically in the context of New York. The community gardens didn't happen, as Pablo was saying uh, in his own uh, metaphor. They didn't happen all of a sudden. They they created, they were created through advocacy and, 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 right. and solidarity work. And now we have a physical manifestation of those. Uh, there, there are dozens and dozens of community gardens in the East Village and many other places in New York. Their outcome of that struggle. So that's a physical manifestation. But regarding Occupy, I would say the manifestation took other forms. It took uh, electing certain people like AOC and others into office. It took many other political manifestations rather than structural in the city. Right. So some of them tend to have a different sort of Trade. outcome and a different time course. Uh, that it's hard to reconcile that when you're in the middle of the movement because you think it's not making a difference, uh, but you see that in a different election cycle. Well, you know, it's a, it's even a, a physical problem, which is a lot of the kind of things that Pablo and I are thinking about translate in a certain kind of bourgeois mentality and the pop-ups, you know, suddenly you have uh, a, uh, an art gallery where there was an empty store and so on, but then just as suddenly it disappears. And the whole notion of tactical urbanism, which is involved in the logic right. of pop-up, pop seems to be very problematic that way because um, you're left with a gesture. And I think that's what, in thinking about opening up a city, we need to see that that's a real problem, tactical urbanism in that way. It's, it's gesture urbanism. Next question, so Elina and then Marivatovara, please. Hi, good evening, it's been really interesting. Um, I've been working uh, with democracy, but I've been also working with future the past 10, uh, 15 years. And I've been thinking, like, I think it's really, really extremely interesting that from the point of view of democracy and its development in the cities, uh, that the future seems to be very technology driven, very data driven. And, and especially now with COVID-19 and its implications, we see a lot of retail, a lot of commerce going much more digital than we've seen before. This will, this will definitely have an impact on how people you know, with the people flows in the city, how we live our daily lives, where we are, what, how we are staying. There are approximations that 25% in the Western countries will stay at home working like, you know, three to five days a week. Um, in the long run, this might have 
drastic effect on how our cities are. So I would like to hear your enlightened perspective. What does it mean for 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 the ideas that you have about uh, how how vibrant cities are, are born? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go in that. I think we, I think Richard and I have discussed this uh, in in previous talk. Uh, how in a way like the the, the COVID nineteen pandemic had different effects on kind of like yeah middle class people that would uh like the say middle class professionals that would kind of like be working from home while during the pandemic where there were kind of like other let's say more kind of like manual workers that still have to commute and and for example during the pandemic they've been kind of like exposed to to being able to to having to take public transport and particularly in cities like london when it's kind of like mass traffic public transport so i think one of the things that we've discussed is the 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 need like if we are going to i mean the, if people are going to let's say travel more uh sorry work more from home or near home i think it's important to uh uh to think uh, i mean to implement more affordable housing policies in the in the city so people can actually afford to live near where they work. I think that's something quite important for the future of cities. If we want to depend less on, on mobility in particular, um, because I don't know, in cities like London pre-COVID and, and even now uh, uh, after COVID, you see kind of like public transport completely uh, crowded of people um, and a network is that is already efficient and it's already saturated. And there's a lot of people who cycle and so on, but still the main issue is that people work very far from home or far from home because they cannot afford to, I don't know, kind of like a manual worker that works near in central London or near central London, there's no way that a manual worker can, can afford uh, living there. So I think housing affordability is a key issue to make cities more sustainable. Well, for me, the just following on that, I am struck by a huge irony in uh, both London and New York. Uh, during the pandemic, there are thousands of small uh, businesses which have gone out of, which have gone bankrupt, and the shops are shut up. And on the other hand, there are uh, tens of thousands of people who are immured in their apartments uh, working from home. Those people are suffering all kinds of social isolation. We know it's taking a, a terrible um, a toll on them mentally uh, uh, and on their children. But we disconnect these two facts that we have abandoned space and we have isolated people. And I think it's a great planning challenge to figure out how to use these empty spaces um, in a way that relieves people from uh, essentially working in their bedrooms, as I am. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? On the one hand, you, you, have, you have emptiness, and on the other hand, you have isolation. And that's real planning. Uh, uh, challenge. Could you uh, open up those spaces which are abandoned in some way so they could be used by a few people, which would make them more, it wouldn't raise the kinds of problems of uh, density. We just don't think as planners about that. You know, we're so compacted that the way the economy works and the way the health system works are sort of, the, they're in different silos in our in our thinking, and that one might solve the question to the, to the other. Uh, so that's something that's been very much on my mind. There are no plans to take over uh, uh, abandoned space, you know, to colonize it. Again, the referent in that would be a place like uh, like Mumbai or Accra, in which when a shop shuts, it's an opportunity for people to colonize it temporarily until somebody else can afford to use it. 
and the city makes that possible. So, you know, when you think rich, you think isolated, I think in a, in a way about, about that. The other thing I would just uh, underline from what Pablo said is that the pandemic, in my view, has increased radically um, uh, class inequality in cities. You can't pick up garbage online. You can't nurse somebody online. So it's the kind of working classes are exposed to the disease and the middle classes or the white uh, middle classes uh, retreat into houses in which, from which they can work. You know? And this, it's, this is not a brilliant connection that I, on my part. Lots of people have observed this, but the language that we've inherited in the dominant culture is that tech is going to uh, revolutionize our cities. You know, it's going to improve them. And here we're seeing something where uh, the simplest kind of tech divide is exacerbating uh, a class divide. And um, so I think that's also something worth pondering about, about this. I think we've dealt very badly as urbanists with, with um, COVID. We haven't been very imaginative about, about how to deal with it. Very, simple notion that if everybody could stay at home, then somehow everything would be better. Yes, I will give the concluding question now to Marie Vatuvara, the professor of, of urban studies at Helsinki University. Marie, are you there? Yes, thank you so much. It's uh, wonderful. It's been wonderful to listen to the, the discussion. I'm really grateful of having the chance to ask a question and it actually relates also a bit uh, on, on Nitin's question on agonism. And um, I would like to ask about the notable changes in the actual outcomes and at the same time also ask and broaden the problem, not only to people in need and without skills, but maybe in Finland about people all in all and their possibilities and and as a background i've been working in finland now some years to understand urban policies and planning and the actual outcomes trying to understand what has changed and how has the urban really evolved it was a work asked by the ministries and the big cities when they are trying to redirect urban policies so in a way what should be done next and our analysis, which is where I would like to ask you about, um, it was not really only about increasing complexity, but it was maybe even more how the cities or land uses or planning policies have become more and more institutionalized. So if you are developing green space, you are it's done by someone. If you are looking at schools, if you are looking at housing or transportation, they are not only institutionalized to different actors, but in the real urban space, they really are uh, different land use, land use parcels. <laughs> so, so all the development, so even, even if in Finland, I think we've, we've been really advanced. We have re even added the right to influence to the Finnish constitution. So it's, it, it is now there that people should be able to join in, participate and influence. But based on our analysis, we still unfortunately cl claim that nothing really has changed because of the institutionalized structure of urban lived environments. Uh -huh. So I, I, I wonder what, what, how would you see the role of 
institutions, and it might go from cities and departments to, mun to, to ministries and up to the welfare state. And where is the room for people in urban complexity to influence the real change? Can, I can start off with that if, if that's okay, Richard. Uh, so, so I think one of the, I, th I think Richard and I, but maybe I, I can speak for myself and maybe we can hear Richard, but I think we are more into into action than into policy. So I think that's something that, and I think that's something that is reflected in the book as well. The importance of taking action and making rather than creating policy. And if I think about, I mean, I, I don't know much the content about Finland, but if I think about London and and things like the London Plan, which is the metropolitan strategy for London, the London Plan has a lot of interesting policies for making London greener. Uh, more fair and kind of like a lot of, I mean, you, you cannot select a policy and say there's something wrong with it. But the, 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 the problem is that the London plan itself and how the system operates is that it's kind of like a, almost like a recipe book for developers to implement any, uh, yeah, any urban development. And even for local authorities, the way the planning system has evolved in the UK, they need to partner up with private developers or even act as private developers to creating their own housing company when delivering them. So at the end, the problem goes beyond policy. It's also kind of like the how the rules of the game have evolved in the last few years. But if we look at what actually is effective in terms of uh, public intervention and, and municipal-led intervention in urban planning is when there are actual plans that are resourced uh, with time and money uh, to be implemented. Uh, and I think that's something that what has been lacking an administration like the Great London Authority, which has a lot of policies and plans, but it has no effective budget to implement any of them. It depends on private developers. I think the only budget that it has is for, for Transfer for London, is the only part of the Greater London Authority that actually has budget. So I think if we look at other alternatives, such as, for example, the one in Barcelona, we've seen that there, are, even, even with not a lot of budget, but there are co concrete actions, such as, I don't know, promoting housing cooperatives or creating, uh, promoting kind of like the creations of community led energy. And, and, and we could see other municipalities all over the world that have more particular actions to the, uh, that have a clear implementation plan uh, to put together. I think that's something quite important, uh, less policy and, and more action to be, to be implemented. Yeah. That would be my, my take. Yeah. Um, you may have suspected the, that uh, we have a certain anarchist uh, streak. Uh, uh, I would uh, just to make that a little clearer. I think what this book is advocating is a shift in planning from being focused on government to being focused on civil society and to creating instruments in civil society like voluntary associations that actually do the work of making cities. Uh, in that sense, like uh, classic anarchists, you know, we're at once very far left and very far right. We want less government. And um, it, it's not a simple shift, but I think what's happened to planning, particularly uh, in the last, uh, uh, since the Second World War, is that planning became the province of planning departments in, in city governments. And this is a disaster. It's, 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 it's a disaster. It leaves people out and it lets in big capital. And I think the only way to really address this is to think what is it that government is doing that could be done better in civil society by groups, uh, 
uh, or by social movements and, and so on. So I think that's a kind of big picture of, of, our, of our book. Uh, as I say, it's very left. It's also very right in, in, in a sense. Although I don't think I'd, I, Donald Trump would be a very happy uh, developer if, uh, if, we, if we had any control over it. But you understand the overall drift of this. It's to displace the act of planning from rules to projects. And the way to do that, to displace the act of planning from rules to projects is a displacement from government to civil, civil society. That's, that's what we're on. This has been an absolute treat. And, and uh, like, thank you all who participated. Thank you all.